Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, the introduction. I have no financial interests or relationships to disclose with regard to the subject matter of this presentation. So why do we model fMRI data? Basically, because it's noisy. We've seen that already in Professor Struthers' talk before. And um, I want to give you another example by just looking at what you always should do when you acquire fMRI data. You should look at your raw data. This is a typical fMRI run, basically a movie of the behaving brain. And um, maybe anyone here in the audience can tell me what this subject is actually doing. So, so look at the movie, and we're, we have this very beautiful pattern recognition device. Does anybody know what was the task of that subject? Just raise your hand, shout out. Okay, so we make it a bit easier. We've learned that bold is a relative measure. So we're not really interested. And it doesn't look so noisy so far because we have this mean in the, in the image time series. So we subtract the mean and look at the fluctuations themselves. Now, what can we see? Uh, we see a lot of fluctuation and you might have spotted something like these edges there, they come from motion. Thermal noise that is also in the background of the image. Physiological noise in the ventricles. And did anybody see the bolt activation so far? Is it louder? No, it's a bit no, it's a bit too low for tapping fingers. Too inferior. So but there is a bold effect. And now you would, might say, well, actually we have heard in the last uh, lecture. Um, this is not really the situation. We don't deal with raw data. We do all this beautiful pre-processing to increase our signal-to-noise ratio. So let's look at the same time series after all the realignment, normalization, smoothing steps. And maybe now you can actually spot what this subject is doing. Okay, I'll give you a little hint. There. Yes, exactly. Hearing. Yeah, it's in the auditory cortex. Exactly. Um, but of course, we see other fluctuations still here, like physiological noise. And overall, um, I want you to take two take-home messages from this exercise. So the first one is: whenever we want to find something out in fMRI, we are um, looking at time series fluctuations as the fundamental information unit of fMRI. And what we do then is we, we kind of separate them into something that we deem a signal that is correlated to our blood oxygen level dependent contrast and something that is other fluctuation and that we just call noise. And if you want to make any inference, we are always talking about the ratio of these two. And our noise in the data always limits our capability of, of making any inference. So we are uncertain, and that's, that's basically shown here with this, with this uncertainty band around the activation. And the actual situation in bold is more like this, or even worse. So inference is contrast to noise, and any meaningful model that we are looking at today um, and also any other meaningful model you want to do have of your fMRI data, both has to estimate the effect size you're interested in and the noise, the unexplained fluctuation. And their comparison, be it as, an, as a T contrast or an F contrast, is what we use to, to perform inference. And the general linear model that we are discussing today is a means to model both signal, both effect and noise. So let's continue that example. So the research question originally was, uh, where in the brain do we represent listening to sounds? And um, if you think about how would you test such an experiment, the first thing that might come to your mind, well, I just play blocks of, because it's a very efficient design, blocks of words that subjects have to listen to, and um, some rest periods in between. 
Then I acquire fMRI data, typical EPIs with three millimeter volumes. And since this is a really 20 year old study, back then they had a le really long TR, but doesn't matter. And um, if we want to address the question where in the brain um, is the processing of words localized, we um, would have to define what we mean by a localized time series. And typically, that is given by our acquisition, and we're looking at voxel, so 3D pixels, and how they, their intensity changes over time. So, now you could ask the question, is this time series reflecting something about the paradigm? Let's take, let's take, oh, sorry, let's take one from the visual cortex. And now we have to have a similarity measure. Is that s something that, that looks like what has happened here in the task in these blocks? And we usually tend to think of these similarities in terms of correlation. And here you could clearly say, well, it doesn't really look like my paradigm. Okay, let's look into the auditory cortex instead. Uh, here we are. So here we actually see a fluctuation that is somehow correlated to our induced task. And the question now is, can we somehow formalize that and also put it into relation to all the other fluctuations we've seen before in the time series? And that's what we do now. So we take our time series, stack into, into a vector. So each, um, each entry of that vector is one intensity of one time point. And we take our um, experimental design also as a vector. And then the general linear model basically makes a prediction from that experimental design towards the time series. And it estimates both the effects and the unexplained variance, the error estimate, which will then enter the statistics. So here we have the time series of, the, of, our, um, of our effect. They're basically zeros and ones. And because, again, the mean doesn't really matter, we can also model an arbitrary mean as a second, co second component, the second constant time series of that model. And we have the error as well. So basically what we see here is that we're just performing um, a combination of that, these two effects of the effect of interest and the mean in a linear fashion. So we're summing up the, um, the two regresses, our two effects into, into one equation and we also add an arbitrary error. This is the, the model for one single voxel. And if we um, want to write it in a, a bit, uh, in a simpler way, instead of using this, these, these sums, uh, these multiple regression uh, as a sum, we formulate it as a, in, a, in a matrix vector form. So we stack our two x's together, the two x vectors become a matrix, and also the both, both scaling factors, both parameters become a beta vector. And this is the same equation. And what you often see in these analysis packages is that the time series is plotted in this black and white uh, grayscale. So um, to make basically large matrices uh, visible in terms of their fluctuations. And black basically means a low value, like zero. And white means a high value. If you, if you scale it, that's maybe one. And here we have the noise also in the same grayscale. So what, ha what we put into this intuitive way of modeling the data is several assumptions. So first one is um, the generality assumption. That means that we model all effects of interest together. So we don't perform what you might know from psychology. We don't perform several regressions. We put everything into one multiple regression. And the second thing is we model here one voxel, but actually we take the same model to model all voxels. So we model all voxels with the same model. The model is linear, and that means, first of all, that the both signal scales proportionally with the modeled effect. So if we have twice the effect in the neuronal activation, we assume that the bold effect is twice as high. And um, we also assume that there is an undisturbed superposition without, without any interaction between the different effects. Um, yeah, and that means if uh, that one effect size doesn't change the other. 
and it's still a model, so it has a limited complexity. That means we assume that it will not explain everything on our data. That would be a case of overfitting, so there is a residual in the model. And it also means, on the other hand, we only have a finite amount of data, so we cannot basically, um, we, we cannot uh, have any complexity of the model because we only have a finite amount of data. So the number of parameters are limited by the number of data points and their wealth, their independent information content. So that's where we are so far. We have um, identified the data in its quality after pre-processing. We have identified how we specify such a model in, in this design matrix X, but there's still two unknowns. One is the parameters, our signal of interest, and the error that we need to assess the significance. So that's the next section. How do we actually um, estimate the parameters of the GLM? And I try to give you both a mathematical uh, insight into that and also a um, in geometrical intuition. So the first option, because these betas are just scaling factors, is we could just fit the model by hand. So we could start with our time series and we could put one, of one beta value for, for each of these parameters, for each of these regresses, and then look how similar it is to the time series that, that we have. So for example, here I vary the, um, the mean and um, we find an appropriate mean. Oh, and now I change the scaling, so the first regressor, until it somehow matches, oh look, this is too small. Nah, now, now the mean is again out of sync. And at some point I find a beta estimate that kind of matches in a, in a minimum error. It is a good overlay to the, to the actual time series course we don't do it like that and the mathematical procedure to minimize this error is called ordinary least squares so we find the find a beta hat that's a predicted parameter vector um, that if it is modeled with a design matrix gives us estimated data predicted data and the error between the actual data and the predicted data that's what we call e and we can actually define that this error should be minimal and minimal means that we minimize the quadratic error. So we square that error and try to fiddle around with the betas until this E is minimal. And an important assumption that's often, well, not stated if we do this kind of minimization is that we assume that the, that the error it has a certain statistical distribution and that it is independently and identically distributed. So if we go into the math, is, which is actually not so difficult, we look at this error vector and, um, and look at its square. So this E um, transposed E is nothing else than the square of the error. And then we do some um, matrix calculation. And um, you can do this at home if you, if you really want to. The only trick you have to, um, you have to know is that if we look at, the trans at this transpose here, so this is, this is just a binomial equation and you get two terms, but because this term here, if you back multiply a vector with, with a matrix and then again with a vector, it's a bilinear, a bilinear equation, and you get a scalar, and the transpose of a scalar is again a scalar. So that's why you can put these two terms together and um, you end up with, a, with this one term. And what you might know from your high school calculus is that if you want to minimize an, um, a function, a quadratic function, um, you just have to set its derivative with, with respect to the parameters to zero. And that's what we do here and end up with this equation. So this is the, this is the way you estimate this optimal beta. Um, for those of you who think, well, uh, high school math is quite a long time, maybe the geometric perspective is more helpful. So basically you can say that I f we find the beta parameters that project, um, that are the closest match in our design space to the actual data we can find. So we have a data vector now we, with three data points, the 3D vector, we only have three time points. And we have two design um, vectors like in our design matrix before, and they span a, a plane. And all data that is modeled with the w well that we can model in this in uh, with this matrix is actually in this design space. 
So we can actually not reach the data because it's not in the plane. But we can try to find the, the data, predicted data, that is as close uh, as possible to the actual data. And just with a bit of intuition, you might think, well, actually, that happens when, I'm, when I have an orthogonal um, error. So if basically this distance, this error is minimal, if, it's, if the point I'm looking at in the plane is um, it's giving me an orthogonal projection of the data. And that's exactly true, and, and here is just the start of the variation. If you assume that the design space is orthogonal to the error and go on from there, you end up exactly at that equation. So now we have everything uh, that we need. We have the error estimated that comes for free once we have the beta estimated. And now we're coming back to, the, the, uh, to this original motive of taking, taking the ratio, the comparison of the contrast and the noise to make a statement, an, an inference. So uh, what we will do is actually we, we compute this ratio as a statistic and then expand it to the whole brain volume. And this is then a statistical parametric map, or SPM, as you've probably heard about or seen in the literature. And usually we are not really interested in all betas at once, but rather only in sums. For example, we are not interested in what is the actual mean value of our data, but only what is the size of the effect of our auditory modeling. And that's why we introduce contrasts, and contrasts are just linear combinations, again, weighted sums of regresses of interest. And in the very simple case, by, by taking a binary vector, we could just choose one of the regressors as, as being our um, target regressor to be, to be queried. And then there are two different ways of, of performing statistical inference with this model, which are, which are straightforward. One is a t-test, and the other one is an f-test. For a t-test, um, we, we can really think of it as a, as a contrast to noise ratio, or in a statistical sense, um, as the question whether there is, there is a contrast value, a beta value, um, that is different from zero, significantly different from zero. And in statistical testing, you formulate the opposite way. You formulate a null hypothesis that my beta is actually zero. And just because of noise in the data, I get, an, uh, I get maybe a value of beta in our est my estimate that is not zero. So you basically ask the question, how likely is it that uh, my fitted beta is not zero if the true beta, that so the true effect in the brain, was actually zero? And, um, and if, but if your t value is too high, if this ratio is too high, the ratio between, um, between the, the contrast and the, um, and the noise, then you must reject this hypothesis. And this is, this is all there is about. So if, if, if my ratio of the, of, the, of the signal and the noise is too high, too different from zero, then there is a very small chance, which is usually um, reflecting this false positive rate, usually choose something like a 5% rate, um, that this beta is zero. So there is an effect. And um, um, referring to uh, what uh, Dr. Sierra said earlier, an important uh, question is not only the, the noise consideration, but also in your design of your experiment, um, the way you specify your paradigm also changes the design matrix. and then because it changes the design matrix, also changes the estimability of a regressor. So this, this uh, least squares estimate that introduces some noise, and that changes depending on what kind of um, design matrix you chose. So, so far we have looked only at one, um, one ratio of one voxel. Now we stack stuff together, so basically instead of having one vector of data, we have a matrix of data, putting the voxels in different columns. And this is expressed by always the same design matrix, but instead of having just one beta vector, we now have a beta matrix, or if you look at it in 3D, um, it's a beta image. And we have also a residual. So the residual is also a matrix. Um, you have a residual for each scan and for each voxel. Now, if you want to just query one contrast, you again take um, multiplied with this contrast vector to get one contrast image. And for the um, estimation of the variance, 
you actually sort of the error of the magnitude or the, the, the power of the error, you take this, this um, error matrix and compute its variance and uh, get something called a residual mean square image. So it's an estimate of the variance that is still in the data, the unexplained variance. And then you put it into the T contrast. So you voxel wise, you, you to, do, do a division of the contrast and the mean squared image or the square root of that and include the design efficiency. This is this part. And thereby you get an estimate uh, of the T value for that, for that contrast. And that's then because it's spatially distributed a T map. So let's return to our example from the um, from the word listening. So we've included some more regressors here, the realignment parameters. So we've heard it's a good idea to include them as confounds in your model. Um, and we ask the question, is there any activation in our data uh, during listening uh, to sounds of these, of these words? And this is this regressor, so we just take a one here. And our null hypothesis, no, there is no effect. And um, if you look at the test statistic, in the images, we um, can compute all these values. So first we have to compute the beta that's done by the estimation. So this is the image. Then we look at the residuals. We see that our model, because it doesn't have physiological noise correction of any, si uh, um, of any sort, is still very bad in the ventricles. It cannot explain the fluctuation there. Doesn't matter for our task though. The contrast image is the same as the beta image because it's just a one on that very beta image. And if you do the ratio of the two, we see that there is a t very high, very bright, so it's again a grayscale, very bright values, very high T values in this auditory cortex. So that's where we are. We are at the T image. And then we now apply this threshold um, yeah, f to, um, to where actually we, as we assume this cannot stem from a, from a zero activation. And here we have a threshold of 0 0.001. And we end up with the, what you've seen a, th a thousand times, probably, um, a statistical parametric map. The brighter it is, the more, uh, the higher the t-value is. The second, the second way of testing um, statistical significance in the GLM is via f-contrasts or f-tests. And the basic principle is, again, the same. You compare um, a certain signal of interest or contrast of interest to a noise estimate. And the difference here is that you, that you can um, account for the joint um, um, explanatory power of multiple regressors. So you, let's take this example. You have a full model that has your, your task and the mean, and it has some nuisance regressors. They are high-pass filter regressors. And you want, want to ask the question whether these high-pass filter regressors actually improve my, um, or explain something in the data. And what you do then is you look at how much residual noise is in the full model, so the E you had before, and compare it to how much noise would have been in, uh, left in the data if I hadn't modeled, if I hadn't modeled these, uh, these effects. And, um, and that's basically an F value. You, you take the variance of the, um, of the difference of the, of the reduced model variance and the full model variance and compare it to the full model variance. And the higher that value is, the more your, your, your regress is explained. And what you do actually, if you specify such a contrast, it's, it's no longer a vector, it's not a weighted, a weighted sum, but it's, um, it's a matrix. And that just comes from the way we specify the, the design matrix as a, as a matrix. And here's an example of where the motion, the rigid body parameters we estimated from, from uh, realignment, explain data in this data set. You see um, at the edges of the brain, yeah, where, where the intensity changes are highest, a lot of variance is explained by, by motion, even after pre-processing. So, so far this was the straightforward explanation how the model estimation and inference works. Now there are some intricacies um, that refer to the variability of the HRF, the um, validity of the noise assumptions we made for estimating the betas, and the fact that we're dealing with hundreds of thousands of, of voxels in our data. So if we look at our model again, um, we 
we have to consider some things that are special in fMRI, and the very first one is that this block design to model a bold is not really is not really very reasonable. So what what we uh, what we've seen before is that the response to a, to a neuronal activation in the bold is actually this yeah sluggish response which with an with a delayed response and also some width of of response as well and an undershoot. S and um, under certain assumptions, uh, well. And the, the assumption that, that this is a lin the brain is a linear time invariant system, we can model um, a linear transformation from this block regressor to the actual bold response in the brain. And um, for for t for repetitions of a stimulus that are not too sh too too uh, close to each other, so let's say on the order of a second, um, we actually can see that that this assumption of of the linear time invariant system holds. So that means. Um, the, the joint response actually is nothing else than a sum of the individual responses to these different stimuli that you, that you can see here. So, um, so you see that if you sum up, so if you, if you convolve this function with these stick regressors and then sum them up, you end up with a response like that. And this is also true for, um, for at least, it's even more true for longer uh, sp um, spacing between the stimulations. And if you if you do that uh, and look at the fit, you actually see that the compared to the to the block regressor, this HRF regressor with the convolution fits the data much better. And it also changes the the appearance in the design matrix. So you have these grayish and delayed um, blocks instead of these black and white blocks here. If you want to be more sophisticated, if you don't assume the bold response to be the same in the different voxels of the brain, then you can um, model not only one basis function, not only one bold response, but a set of them. So you would include not only the, um, the HRF for convolution, but you would include a second regressor that you convolve with the derivative, a temporal derivative of that bold response. And that is like a Taylor expansion uh, accounting for a small delay in the in your response so bold might be later or earlier maybe in the brain stem on the motor cortex and um, and same for the width of the response that's modeled with the dispersion derivative the derivative with respect to the width and there are also other basis functions possible for example you might have thought might have asked yourself how do, did people originally estimate this hrf and one way to do it is with a finite impulse response fitting so you just take a lot of regresses that that uh, that have s that account for certain bins after your stimulus onset. If you fit that and put them the betas together, you end up with a, such a response. And um, again, if you want to ask for any effect um, in the brain um, with respect to any of these basis functions, you can use an F contrast over all three of these um, basis functions. The Probably most w one of the most important problems um, in in using the GLM is the validity of the noise assumptions we we use so far. So the, o the ordinarily squares estimates are only valid um, and they're only optimal if the residual error um, is indeed Gaussian, independently and identically distributed. And of course, it's neither independent over time. There are zero correlations nor is it identical over time. So we've seen examples of drift, but there are also others. And um, maybe here it's important to, to remind ourselves of what we called noise before. So we said noise is all other fluctuations, but we can categorize it a bit. We can say, well, there's one kind of noise which is temporally uncorrelated, thermal noise, which we can address with spatial smoothing, but also with temporal smoothing, uh, temp sorry, high pass filtering, so removing some part of that uninteresting noise. And there's also structured noise. That's the one that's temporally correlated and that has both risks um, of false negatives. So you lose power, you lose sensitivity, um, but also of false negatives, uh, sorry, false positives, if it's correlated to your task. And there are two solutions to deal with both of these, um, both of these noise categories. One is um, what we've also seen in, the, uh, in um, Professor Struthers talk. We can actually use a GLM for confound modeling and regress out structured noise. So 
um, that we've done for the mean regressor very intuitively before, but you can do it for any kind of um, regressor set. And the second um, idea is to use a linear transformation of the data, design matrix, and noise together. So you filter not only, well, you not only, yeah, you filter basically your whole model with a with another linear operation, and that's called pre-whitening, or actually it's the same math as doing high-pass filtering, not in the model space but in the pre-processing of your data. The problem here is this needs knowledge of the actual noise statistics. So you have to actually look at your noise and, and estimate how, for example, not identical it is and how non-independent um, it is. And yeah, and, and all these things still assume that the no noise is Gaussian, the Ga Gaussian. Otherwise, you have to uh, resort to the um, to generalized as opposed to general linear models. And uh, here's an example for the, uh, for the first solution, so the modeling approach. So we used a discrete cosine transform, slow drifts as def different regresses, and put them into our model. And here you can actually see that the, um, that the original data has this drift, the blue one. And if we only model our, our bold response, we still have this drift, which looks like noise then in our, in our um, model. But if we model the confound regresses as well, then um, which are which are um, which are black here, then the the effect estimated for the um, f sorry the yeah the predicted response basically is the same for the for the bold effect, but the predicted noise that we use for the contrasting for the ratio is much smaller because we've explained this variance. And um, for the pre-whitening approach, um, a, a very common example is again the heartbeat because it has a very, very um, cyclic, very periodic cycle that um, that creates co co autocorrelations with the ev with every every second basically. And um, if we look at the covariance of our residual, we can see that, and um, we can use this uh, to to find a matrix, a pre-whitening matrix. That, that removes this covariance in the residual. And it's really just that we, we have this matrix W that we pre-multiply to our data, or to our matrix, and to our um, noise. And then this pre-whitened noise is actually IID. And um, yeah, it's very simple. You, you take the covariance matrix, and then you take its inverse and, and basically square root of that. And the third problem, um, which is actually probably um, so so difficult that we need a whole lecture to explain it, in how to solve it. But the the problem is really simple. Um, the um, the fact that we actually model hundreds of thousands of voxels means that um, that even if we set a typical statistical threshold of, of 0.05, so five percent false positive rate, it still means that there are yeah, several thousand voxels wrongly activated or could be activated even if there was no effect. And this massive problem with multiple comparisons can be corrected in different ways. One, the simplest one is to use a Bonferroni correction. So say, well, it's, I don't use um, p-value of 0.05, but I divide by the number of voxels. And then on average, I only have one, well, I have a 5% chance of having one, one voxel to be wrongly activated. But it's too conservative because the spatial structure of our noise is not independent, it's not random. And there are other solutions, like a family-wise error correction, um, that use some distributional assumptions in space about the noise and can come up with a more liberal peak value or cluster extent thresholds. So you, you, you say, I, I want at least 100 voxels that have a t-value larger than 4 or something. And uh, what uh, Professor Strather mentioned earlier, false discovery rate is another way to account for that. That, that gives you um, uh, basically the, the number of wrongly activated voxels would then be only 5%. So now we are there. So we have a generally a model that models the effect of our experiment manipulation on the acquired data. It includes all experimental effects and confounds. It estimates the effects and the errors on a voxel by voxel basis. And it has um, the possibility of a statistical assessment by taking ratios of this estimated effect and error magnitude. 
And because we are dealing with fMRI data, there are a number of intricacies we have to consider. So we've seen the non-trivial bold response, we've seen the validity of the Gaussian statistical assumptions, and the statistical significance in the light of of a multiple comparison problem. And there are others like correlations between regressors and the question of how do we do second level analysis with, these, with this data. And um, as a conclusion, the short answer to all, to all the questions posed in this talk. So we model the data. Why do we model the data? Because BOLD is hard to detect amidst all the other fluctuations. What is the generally a model? It's a weighted sum of all effects and confounds under the assumption of um, independently identically distributed Gaussian noise. How are the parameters estimated? By minimizing the squared error between the model and the data. How do we perform statistical testing? We contrast, we compute contrast to noise ratios, which can be T or F values that compare effect sizes to noise levels. And um, what is special when doing this for fMRI? Well, it's the bold response function, the validity of the noise assumptions that are questionable sometimes, and the multiple comparison correction. Yeah, so, so thank you for listening, and um, the bold um, literature is highly recommended reading.